My name is Liza Knapp. I'm chair of the Slavic department, and I'm going to introduce the panel. And then there's a you know, schedule um, that we will go through. And first of all, Jessica Merrill is, as many of you know, an assistant professor in the Slavic department. She did her PhD at UC Berkeley. And before coming to Columbia in 2016, she was a Mellon fellow at um, Stanford in humanities at Stanford, and then a postdoctoral fellow at the Center for Cultural Analysis at Rutgers. We're here to explore her origins of Russian literary theory, folklore, philology, and form. I'm not going to say anything about that because that will be um, said in a minute, but I want to mention that she's at work on a new project, and it's called Circling in Time and Space modern temporalities and the narration of experience. And it studies the chronotope of cyclical time and bounded space as um, this chronotope appears in different genres. And she includes the Russian, the Russian decadent and symbolist fiction, Soviet science fiction, contempor and contemporary personal narratives communicated orally and online. Um, and then, our next speaker is going to be um, Ilya Klieger, and he's downtown, an associate um, professor in the Department of Russian and Slavic Studies at NYU. And his main fields are the 19th century Russian novel, theory of the novel, literary theory, and the relationship between philosophy and literature. His book is The Narrative Shape of Truth, Veridiction in Modern European Literature. 2011, and he and Boris Maslov um, co-edited a volume called Persistent Forms, Practic Practicing Historical Poetics. And he's at work on another book with a working title of Sovereign Fictions, The Poetics and Politics of Russian Realism. And then um, the next speaker will be Mark Lipavetsky, who as many of you know, is a professor in the Slavic department here at Columbia. His fields of re both research and teaching range, uh, range widely, post-Soviet um, culture, Russian modernism, post-Soviet drama, late Soviet non-conformist literature, and tricksters in Soviet culture and also around the globe, or, uh, global core. Um, Class, and he is at work on a critical biography of um, Dmitry Prigov and is the editor of five volumes of Prigov's collected works. And in 2019, he won the Andrei Bieli Prize for his service to Russian literature. And then um, Dennis Tenen is an associate professor in English and comparative literature here at Columbia. And he is co-founder of Columbia's Group for Experimental Methods in the Humanities. And there, as well as in his teaching and other projects, he's been an important innovator in the study of humanities at Columbia these days. And he's the author of Plain Text, The Poetics of Computation. And he's published in many different venues on many different topics, including book piracy, data visualization, algorithmic composition. And recently he had an op-ed in the LA Times on the language used in resistance to COVID vaccination. I wanna you know, thank everybody for being here. And we'll start with Jessica Merrill introducing the book and then um, we'll have comments and responses. And at the end, there will be time for discussion and questions from you all. And also with Mark Lipovetsky's help from the people on Zoom. Hi. Um, can you hear me okay? Okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you to the Heyman Center and to all of the panelists and to Liza for this generous introduction and the audience for you all being here. I am just so touched and honored that this whole event has been put together about this book. So um, 
I thought I, I have the task of starting off with some introduction. Um, and so I thought I would start by way of uh, intellectual history, which is a mode that I like to operate in. Um, so the history really of the project, um, I thought I'd start at the beginning, which is with my dissertation, which as Liza mentioned, I wrote at Berkeley under the supervision of Irina Paperna and Harsha Ram. And my dissertation was prompted by the question, why are there so many references to folklore in Russian formalist theory? Um, very simple question maybe, but this was perplexing to me in light of the stridently modernist orientation of the movement. The formalists, as many of you know, equated literariness with novelty. As Shklovsky put it, literature allows us to see an object as if for the first time. So why would they return so repeatedly to seemingly conservative genres, that is to folklore, to elaborate their ideas? From the outset, I was inspired by Galim Tekhanov's 2004 article, Why Did Literary Theory Originate in Central and Eastern Europe? Um, You know, I'm trying to. Uh, oh, I double click. Oh, okay. Um, so this is just a list of some sort of major sources of, of inspiration. Um, and so Tehana's article pointed me to the cultural historical context of literary theory for looking for answers to my question. And I thought insight might come from the institutions in which literary theory was developed. And so I spent a year doing research in the archives of the Moscow and Prague linguistic circles and the personal archives of the members of the Payaz, that is the Society for the Study of Poetic Language. In the end, the thesis of my dissertation was that folklore served as a kind of stepping stone between linguistics and literary theory. I showed how linguistic methodologies were first applied to folklore and then from folklore to the study of literature, and that this transfer of ideas often occurred through scholarly collaboration within and between these societies, that is the Moscow and Prague linguistic circles, as well as the Payas. Um, after, after my PhD, I held two postdocs, again, as, as Liza. Uh, mentioned first at Rutgers um, and then at, the, at Stanford. And these allowed me to considerably broaden the scope of my thinking. At Rutgers, I was meeting for a year with a group of humanities scholars to discuss contemporary theories of form, such as in particular, the movement in English studies known as new formalism. And while at Stanford, I began two important collaborations, one with the historical poetics working group, which was actively and still is uh, actively re-examining the legacy of the 19th century Russian philologist Alexander Vysolovsky, and the second with Igor Pilshikov, who had gained, in the meantime, access to scan the entire archive of the Moscow Linguistic Circle, um, which he generously. <laughs> there we go. That's why I'm finally <laughs> I'm maybe figuring out. At any rate, so this is just an example of one of the minutes of a meeting from 1919. Um, so that I had then after the dissertation access to really systematically go through this, this archive, which is an amazing source. Um, so as a result, when I turned to writing my book, I was no longer primarily interested in why literary theorists were citing folkloric examples, but rather in how literary theory emerged from philology. I now understood the presence of folklore as a symptom of the prehistory of literary theory and philology. And so I was also now thinking about how this longer history could be made relevant for literary studies today. In order to articulate the relationship between Russian formalism and 19th century philology, I reconstruct what I call the philological paradigm. And I stress this is not the philology of textual criticism, which is perhaps more familiar to literary scholars, that is the reconstruction of original source texts accompanied by professional commentary, a methodology developed in classical philology and exemplified by Karl Lachmann. Rather, the tradition relevant to the emergence of Russian formalism is comparative philology, as it was initially developed by Franz Bopp, Rasmus Rask, and Jakob Grimm. This is the comparative study of the history of word sounds, but the method was soon extended to comparative mythology and folklore studies by Jakob Grimm himself, and then in the Russian context, I focus on the comparative philologists Fyodor Buslaev and later Alexander Vysolovsky and Alexander Pekinian. Yeah. Not to, there we go. 
Um, the philological paradigm is, um, right, so it relies on the comparative method and also apparently re uh, importantly relies on the romantic philosophy of language, informed in large part by the ideas of Wilhelm Humboldt. This philosophy held that oral dialogic speech is the linguist's true object of study and stressed the inherent creativity of the speech act, which was studied in psychological terms. The philological paradigm is thus bifurcated into two separate but complementary fields of study. The comparative study of the history of language, which reveals stable normative forms, and the study of verbal creativity, including poetic creativity, which, is, which was approached through the psychology of psychological theory of the day, sorry, which was primarily associationism. And these fields were not integrated further in the 19th century. Normative forms were seen to constrain the speaker, but not to explain creativity. Russian formalism, I argue, emerges out of this paradigm. Viktor Shklovsky, Yuri Tinyanov, Roman Jakobson, and others began by taking on the research goals that motivated their predecessors. They asked the same questions. What is poetic language? And why are similar plots found all over the world? Or in other words, what are the rules of narrative structure? Their challenge is to integrate the inherited paradigm, to bring a definition of poeticity into a more necessary relationship with the forms and patterns revealed by comparison, what Shklovsky referred to as devices, I think. The most famous solutions for this problem belong to Yuri Tinyanov and Roman Jakobson. And Jakobson's articulation of parallelism as the imperial, sorry, empirical criterion of language and the poetic function is particularly eloquent and concise. He argues, of course, that the perception of an utterance as poetic, what he calls the set towards the message as such, correlates with the degree to which a text is formally and semantically patterned. Jakobson's and Tinyanov's theories are well known and understood. They have benefited from their proximity to structuralist theory, which provided the lens through which formalism was interpreted for decades. My goal in the book was to excavate other non-canonical responses to the philological paradigm, theories that have been forgotten or misunderstood. Uh, and this is just the list of the uh, table of contents. And so I do this primarily in chapters two through four, right? These are these kind of what I call forgotten paths in the history of theory. And while these paths, right, are not easy to synthesize, right, and that they're all kind of going in slightly different directions, the branches of thought that I prioritize are those that theorize literary form by reference, not, sorry, by reference to notions of the work or literature as a systemic whole, but which theorize form as something that can travel across texts and historical contexts. For Shklovsky in the 1920s, recurring forms are explained by reference to psychological universals. For Jakobsen and his pre-structuralist work in the Moscow linguistic circle, poetic language is thought of as more something like poetic idiolect um, and is broken down into various dialectal or uh, idiolect features which can travel from one speaker to another through language contact. So the notion of traveling form is a concept that structuralist theory dismissed as unsophisticated. However, as the formalists themselves recognized and argued at points, a form that escapes the boundaries of the work is a form that has potentially immediate sociopolitical relevance. Rethinking the concept of form in sociopolitical terms has been a priority for formalist literary studies in the 21st century. And while I would not expect that the formalist early ideas could be picked up and applied as they are, a hundred years later, my hope is that by explaining them in a new light, that is as reactions to the philological paradigm, rather than as failures on the path to structuralism, they may serve as a source of inspiration for thinking about literary form today. Is it on now? Okay, thank you so much um, uh, to the Heyman Center and to Liza for inviting me and mostly, uh, of course, to Jessica herself for providing the, the pretext for us to get together and talk about, uh, about these, uh, these ideas in this book. To those who care about the fate of the humanities but have not yet read this book, I urge you to do so. Its title is Deceptive, 
And unlike most kinds of deception of this sort, it is deceptively modest. To be sure, we are here in the presence of a richly detailed story of the origins of Russian literary theory, a highly original, to some scandalous, though nothing in its lucid uh, uh, style and sober tone indicates anything like the courting of scandal. Still, always at the horizon, one can sense broader questions, questions that go to the very core of uh, humanistic method as such. This is, of course, in the spirit of Russian formalism itself, uh, Russian formalists themselves who were contrary to what they are sometimes, uh, to what they sometimes asserted and contrary to what was asserted about them, deeply engaged with the philosophical underpinnings of their method. In addition to everything else it does, Jessica's book supplies overwhelming evidence to this effect. Let me give a sketch which will somewhat overlap with Jessica's uh, of the book's overall argument as I understand it. It goes as follows. Due to the contingencies of its reception in Russia and the West, Russian formalism has for a long time been understood as the precursor to European structuralism. As a result, certain elements of the movement have been suppressed, treated as false starts, devalued, de-emphasized, condescended to, and so on. Concurrently, a set of received ideas about the movement became entrenched, that it is anti-psychological, anti-philological, anti-philosophical, eager to assert the autonomy of literature from history and intent on distinguishing every day from artistic uses of language. In recent years, scholars have come to challenge this notion to uncover different genealogies for, for formalism and to look for different possible continuations of its legacy. This book constitutes a major contribution to this trend by turning attention to the oft denied, but for those who will read the book, ultimately undeniable link between formalism and 19th century traditions of comparative philology, folkloristics, and historical poetics, as well as the psychological presuppositions embedded in these disciplines. Once we appreciate the connection, a rather different formalism emerges, one that is much harder to sublate as an inferior, less mature version of structuralism on the one hand, and one that is perhaps open to alternative recuperation at the current moment on the other. Among the things that I find satisfying about this emancipation of formalism from its supposed teleological culmination or dead end in structuralism is that it repeats a classical formalist gesture, shifting the dominant within the field of ideas generated by the movement and thus creating alternative trajectories of its historical employment. It is of course impossible to engage with all or even one for that matter <laughs> argument uh, of the book. Uh, so I will touch only briefly on one issue, which is, I think, especially central to chapters one and three, one through three, but relevant throughout, the titular issue of the form. We have become accustomed to our form. We have become accustomed to thinking about form, so I think goes the argument, within the parameters of a tradition that reaches back to idealist philosophical aesthetics arriving to us by way of phenomenology, new criticism, certain brands of structuralism, and contemporary practices of close and surface reading. Within this tradition, form has been understood in an organicist fashion as an all embracing network of relations among the various elements of the text taken as a clearly bounded autonomous unity. According to Jessica, there is a strain of such aesthetic thinking about form within Russian formalism. Again, as I understand, and this train is connected specifically to the name of the, the demonized name of Yuri Tinyanov. <laughs> Sorry, I don't mean it. Uh, uh, there, there's going to be a tinyanov shkovsky confrontation at the end. This is just a. Um, this is just a. a King know, Congress Gazette. Yeah. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> who is who is it? Um, there is a strain of such aesthetic thinking about form in Russian formalism, uh, and it is perhaps unsurprising that this strain has been taken up by literary theory um, and, and criticism more often than the other. From our point of view, perhaps more unconventional strain, reaching back to the traditions of comparative philology, historical poetics, and articulated most clearly and consistently in Viktor Shklovsky's work on narrative prose. This notion of form relies on not on philosophical aesthetics, but on universal psychological and even physiological principles 
of what we might call today affective economy. Examples of such forms are familiar to us from Shklovsky, narrative deceleration, stepped construction, psychological parallelism, and so on. I have to confess that I have for a long time viewed Shklovsky's narrative theory with suspicion. His notion of form has seemed to me unsatisfying with its undialectical insistence on treating form and content as clearly separable. So something that Tenyanov mocked by, uh, by the, in the phrase form to content as glass to wine in, the, in, in, in his um, book on, uh, on verse. Uh, I have felt attracted to Tenyanov's notion that in language and indeed in nature as well, there is no content that is not already formed, that all form is in fact deformation, uh, that what counts or functions as content and what functions as form is a changeable matter. And in fact, form as deformation can only be registered in motion by what he calls archeology span of movement as dynamic form. Yet reading Jessica's account made me wonder if perhaps indeed time has come for the junior branch of formalism to gain the upper hand. After all, the book, um, the book shows us, um, as the book shows us, the Sklovskian notion of form is refreshingly universalist and anti-elitist. And in fact, there's a wonderful section there with Sklovsky and linking Sklovsky to populism, which I really appreciated and, and started thinking more about, to Narodnictwo indirectly, um, erasing sharp boundaries between ostensibly high and low genres of verbal creation. Uh, such a notion furthermore distances us from the organicist bias that consistently insinuates itself into our practices of close reading. It likewise undermines the strange but persistent fiction of the autonomy of the work of art. In its emphasis on effective regulation, it also, in a sense, bypasses by the linguistic turn, uncoupling narrative form from the exhausted analogy of grammar. And finally, this notion of form allows for more open-ended historicization of literary texts, less confined now to immediate historical context and tied instead to immemorial narrative practices. Still, I do have some lingering questions on which I will, on which I will end, which, yeah, feel free to address now or I'm sure future conversations. The most general to pose the, uh, way to pose my question would be this, and this is not a question pertaining to the historical account, which I find 100% compelling and fascinating, uh, but to prospects for the future. Are there other conceptual resources within the formalist corpus that could help us confront the methodological challenges of the moment, specifically, I would like to mention three categories, none of them prominent in the brand of formalism highlighted in your book. These are the already mentioned notion of dynamic form and the corresponding practice of archeology span of movement, ustanovka, set or orientation towards external series. And uh, finally, the mysterious system of systems, which never gets elaborated, but is in fact one of the most promising, um, I think, moments of suggestions in, in the formalist corpus. These concepts all, I think, interrogating the heteronomy, the heteronomic dimensions of literary form, right? In other words, not its autonomy, but its dependence or its relationship, uh, certainly don't go back to the philological uh, paradigm, but they are not straightforwardly structuralist either. Instead of conceiving literary heteronomy in terms of direct social demand or psychic economy, they posit a more mediated process. They see political and economic factors making their way into literary texts by way of a kind of recoding that translates response to and intervenes in the social situation in a semi-autonomous way. Outside the Russian formalist tradition itself, congenial approaches arise within the paradigm of the Frankfurt School in the work of Louis Althusser and Pierre Machery, Frederick Jameson, and others. These approaches are historically attuned without being strictly contextualist. They are interested in the network of relationships, semantic and formal both organizing the text, but reject autonomous and bounded nature of such relationships. They are hermeneutical, but their hermeneutics 
foregrounds not authorial consciousness or thematic content, but the dynamics of form and deformation. Another way to put this in conclusion would be to ask to what extent are we dealing with two non-compatible paradigms? And again, I'm overly simplifying by think, speaking of two even here. Um, my, my intuition is that there's actually ways in which these two can be brought, brought, brought together in some way, potentially at least. Are these mutually exclusive alternatives? Can they be in some way conjugated in the context of a search for method that would appear promising today? Again, this is only one line of inquiry provoked by this original, rich, and highly consequential book. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I want to say thank you to, to Jessica for writing this extremely interesting, and I agree with Elia, highly provocative book, um, despite its very academic outlook. Uh, and uh, to, to continue with what Elia started, I also uh, very much support the mm, an ambitious task that Jessica sets before herself to basically outline the uh, alternative uh, paradigm uh, and alternative lineage of literary analysis, of understanding of humanities, of understanding of the form that she finds in the so well-researched Russian, Russian formalism. And uh, I, I only can applaud to, to her desire to decouple uh, formalism from structuralism and to see um, sort of to remove it from the shadow of structuralism and uh, reveal things that are different different from what we know from the structuralist in interpretation of form <clears throat> and um, if, if if I understand correctly I uh, the, 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 to continue the conversation about the form uh, Jessica arrives uh, more or less um, coherently to the understanding of the form as uh, uh, the universal concept, of course, as equal to any other social forms. I'm not going uh, looking into the natural world, uh, <laughs> but in, in the social world and the uh, literary cultural world, the form uh, operates on, on similar principles and uh, these principles uh, formalism um, discusses quite well. Uh, actually, this idea about a literary form as equal to other social forms has already been uh, pronounced by, by Pirival in the 1920s. Gastif wrote about this. Uh, but but that, that was also in, in discussion with formalists, of course. So the, the, the main um, merit uh, is, is this, this, this ambitious task. And I think that, that Jessica very successfully fulfills it. And this book uh, will be read and, and debated, I'm sure. And debate is the best reaction that the book in the humanities can can dream of. Um, of course, it is very important that, that, that uh, Jessica continues this uh, work of uh, uh, revealing the, the, the forgotten or little known um, legacy of Russian philology of the 19th century, and not only Vysilovsky and Patibnya, uh, but also Khrushchevsky, Steinhal, she, she, she writes about Spiransky and Shakhmatov and, and their influences on on this theory, it's, it's all very important. But of course, in the context of uh, formalism, it, it is incredibly paradoxical because these were exactly those people whom uh, formalists openly criticized, whom they openly rejected as, as, as non-fathers. They, 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 they didn't want to have anything in common with them. Uh, but as, as Jessica shows, they, they certainly do. And the, 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 this is a real historical discovery. And that, that basically, proves what we already know about, about history that rejected legacy remains in the you know, DNA and sort of works out despite, despite the intention of, of the new generation of, of scholars, writers, et cetera. Um, another, another very, very, very important, important uh, concept that, that, that Jessica brings up is the concept of the uh, artist as performer, and and uh, here she um, um, develops uh, the, the declarations of formalists about sort of literature uh, history of literature without great names, uh, and of course uh, Shklovsky's ideas about sort of constant recycling of the 
uh, repertoire of devices, uh, sort of shifting them from, from margins to the center, um, et cetera. Um, but, but, and the, the leading, leading um, sort of metaphor here is the a description of the folk singer that, that Shklovsky frequently cites and, 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 and uh, Jessica brings in by, uh, by Rybnikov, uh, where, where, and please correct me if, if, if I will sort of summarize it in the wrong way, where every folk singer creates his or her own uh, version of the same uh, text uh, by, 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 by creating a new version of the form, uh, and by this means sort of transforming the text, but maybe not radically, yet still very much, much tangibly. Uh, and uh, in, in, in this description, uh, Jessica sees the model of the authorship that, that, that formalism promotes. But I, I think that this, this is a little too straightforward uh, because, uh, so, so my question here is uh, what happens with the categories of zdvig, shift, nivyaska, disjoint, right, rupture, all these things that, that, that are absent in the folk performative genre, right? And uh, which, uh, of course, avant-garde that, that inspired and Jessica writes about this formalist directly uh, brings forward. So, so how does uh, avant-garde change the, the performative function of the, of the author? That, 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 that's a question that, that uh, I think um, Jessica's book asks, but, but uh, I, I want to hear her answer. Uh, she, she at the same time uh, notices the thing that, that I, didn't, I didn't notice before, and, and, and that's, that, that, that's a great observation. I think that, that despite uh, early declarations about literature about, without, without great, great names, they all end up uh, with uh, writing biographies. And uh, Shklovsky basically found biography of himself as the main source of uh, inspiration. And he was constantly rewriting it and reshuffling. Um, and there is, there is a great paradox here and, and, and Jessica sort of uh, asked this question and, and decides not to, not to give an exact answer. But I think that there is something very, very crucial uh, about the development of formalism uh, and it cannot be reduced to, to, to the external pressure of circumstances and the, the sort of need to uh, con conform to the very conservative a milieu of Soviet literary scholarship, right? Um, maybe, just maybe, it's my, it's, it's my, my, my guess uh, that, 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 that appeared while reading um, Jessica's book. Maybe biography is also a form or rather a metaphor. And, and this, this, this form serves as the most important filter that allows to sort of process this reservoir of devices, so, so it's, it's not that that it's it, it, it really a reservoir of devices. It, it comes through different channels, and biography is is this very powerful, very active agent, right? Uh, form that 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 uh, delivers uh, certain devices and certain experiences already formed to 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 the author. Uh, so what? It's, it, of course, it, it's, it's the question rather than the statement, right? Um, I also am very happy that 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 uh, thanks to uh, Jessica's book. Um, I understand that she was not the first one, but she did it very convincingly. Uh, the scope of uh, Russian formalism is extended beyond uh, classical three names, right? Uh, first of all, um, she, she basically argues that uh, Brick is more important as a theorist than Echenbaum. Uh, I'm not in complete agreement with this, but, but I, like, I like the statement. Uh, and secondly, uh, of course, bringing in uh, all this rich material from uh, Moscow linguistic circle, uh, that's, that, that's priceless. And that, that's not just, just for some uh, little references, but really digging in and analyzing and looking at um, Jacobson's uh, theory of uh, literary dialect as, as the, uh, the language that the author, individual author produces. And uh, Again, if I understand correctly, uh, Jessica argues that this literary dialect was was um, presented by uh, Young Gibson as the most important product of creativity, not not the work of art, but the dialect, but the sort of modification of individual version of language, and the most most sort of 
provocative for me at least uh, way to discuss this is through actual development of dialectology, right? So dialect is not a metaphor, but dialect is dialect as it was formulated in the contemporary linguistics. And that, that, that that's incredibly interesting. And to, I, I think that's a true discovery. So, so at least this, these three uh, merits make this book worthy of uh, celebration. Uh, at certain point, uh, uh, Jessica uh, sort of puzzles why, why young people uh, in 1918, 1919, 1920, in the midst of the civil war, in the midst of starvation, were uh, getting together and discussing uh, poetic form, uh, phonetic uh, correspondences, things that, that, that seem to be irrelevant to, to, to the moment and even to their, to their survival. And, and she suggests that, that, that the, the idea that language can change the minds was behind these processes. I think that, that since we are sort of reading Jessica's books in the time of war, uh, uh, her, her book suggests some, some other uh, interpretation of this situation, probably because uh, doing philological analysis is something that, that gives the sense of stability in the unstable time, something that, that connects with, with the substance that, that is incredibly dynamic, but still stable, still is not going to, uh, to, 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 to perish. And that's, that's a big source of, of this. Now, first of all, let me tell you that, that um, I, I love this book and I'm a bit of a ringer, ringer here. Uh, Webster, uh, Webster tells me a ringer is an athlete or horse fraudulently substituted for another in a competition or event, uh, but, but not in the way you think. So uh, I, I love this book. I read it, I read it very slowly, partly because uh, after many paragraphs, I had to put it down and go for a walk. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. It really is a, it's a book. And the reason for this, besides uh, this being a very clearly and elegantly written book, is that it's very close. It lies very close to my intellectual history. I, by complete accident, uh, ended up studying as an undergraduate with Omri Ronan at, mm -hmm. at University of Michigan, who at the time invited the late Mikhail Gasparov um, to, to lecture, and, and who, who himself at the time was really keen on Yarko, on the work of Yarko, and, and advancing the work of Boris Yarko, who is, as you know, and if you don't know, he was kind of like too formal for the formalist, because his work was too quantitative and too mathematically complex. Now, so, so that is to say, uh, I consider myself a, a student of this tradition. In graduate school, I ended up studying with Bill Todd and with Svetlana Boehm, who are, although not formalists, they're careful readers of that tradition. So the point is, it, this has been a part of my intellectual life for, for a long time. So I'm a student of this tradition, but I'm also an unlikely historian of this tradition. I'm now finishing a book, which is another alternative history of formalism, which has to do with American sources of popular writing, how to write a bestseller kind of formalism uh, uh, in a very different way, provides another piece of the puzzle that Jessica puts together. And I am a practitioner, I am a kind of a formalist. Uh, myself, I'm a computational linguist of sorts. Uh, my recent project on vaccine hesitancy is a study of folklore. Uh, it's a, you know, of the way people talk about language, very much influenced by the sources here. Now. So I'm a student, I'm a historian and practitioner of this tradition. That's why I couldn't, I, it was, it, this is an important book for me. Now, what, what, why I love this book so much is that there, there are at least three misconceptions that are continually uh, uh, annoy me in the work and in conversations. When I present my work and when I tell people that I come from this particular tradition, they usually kind of give me some version of this. Now, there's probably more than three. You already addressed one mystery, like the presence of folklore, but, but there's th at least three others. And um, uh, the first of these is the, for me, again, I'm sorry, the annoying presence of Saussure in, in the conversation, and, or kind of, he's, he's there as kind of this pioneering, foundational, important figure for formalists and structuralists, whereas when you read the tradition yourself, he's important, but not, there's much more to say about and, and he's kind of a marginal figure for, for, for this particular 
uh, canon, and you know, I would argue for Jakobson. Uh, long story, but point is, when you read traditional histories of formalism and structuralism, they terminate in a very unsatisfying way intellectually. And I think this book provides us a much, much deeper and much truer to the sources intellectual history of this tradition. So, so that's number one. The second kind of mystery that's being re rectified is that I think, it, I mean, it is that like um, biographical presence, you know, l l philology in the times of war. How, how do those things co uh, coexist in one and the same tradition? Um, which, uh, which again, I think you do, you do quite a bit in, in trying to unravel that mystery, but that has to do with probably the biggest misconception of them all. And there is a cartoonish image of formalism that has to do with like just the text, only intri intrinsic. It's some kind of apolitical, abiographical sense. I mean, it's completely not true to the sources, to, to this tradition, right? The fact that formalists are only concerned with literary form and only with poetic language I think that's just nonsense. And I'm, I'm frankly tired of having that argument with you know, people who should know better and with graduate students. And now I have a secret weapon and that is this book. Now I can say, please, here, you know, like I'm, I'm going to cite this very widely. I'm going to reference this widely. I'm going to assign this widely uh, because it fills in these important gaps um, in my work. Now, in, uh, look, I can talk about this forever. Uh, let me give you also three further impacts of your work that maybe maybe are unexpected. Now we already talked about historical, right? You you, you do a historiography here that's that's very important. A much richer universe. Like instead of Saussure, we get Humboldt, we get Herder, we get Grimm, James, Wundt, the folk psychology of Wundt. I mean, uh, we should talk a lot about that. I mean, it, it's it's it is you know it is uh, for me it's a more satisfying when I reach back to to the sources that inspire my work today, I, you know, I want to reach back for that archive, right? Uh, and, and your book helps me do that. That's number one. Number two, the history and the historiography of comparative literature as a field. You know, I come kind of, kind of from Slavic, but kind of, you know, my, my, my degree is in comparative literature. I'm in the department of comparative literature. There is an important kind of intersection between the comparative philology method that you are describing and the history of comparative literature, which, which often makes the same kind of mistakes. It often terminates in a very unsatisfactory way in World War II, in a particular moment when we begin to see Jakobsen and that generation kind of in the United States, but there's kind of myopia beyond, beyond World War II. And I think uh, in that conversation, your book is a very, in, provides a really interesting archive for those interested in the history of the comparative method, which kind of look exactly same sources, Humboldt, Herder, Grimm, right? But very similar, so fascinating. And finally, uh, I see great potential of this work for the future computational work, right? So again, uh, the kind of sources you allude here, you know, I can imagine the course in computational literary analysis in sort of contemporary uh, computational linguistics that, that that draws heavily from the archive that you are examining, and I think makes the practice of computational work of the sort that kind of I practice, uh, uh, kind of in non-historian way, uh, it makes that, it enriches that work greatly. And I think it not just enriches, it's those threads that kind of, that uh, either terminate or are not picked up and not developed, I see great inspiration there for myself, for my students, uh, and hopefully for, 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 our, for our colleagues, uh, where I can kind of reach, reach in there and kind of think of how to continue that tradition going forward, perhaps using you know, more kind of computational whatever, whatever tools. But that's secondary to, 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 to that archive. So I, I think that's uh, eight minutes pretty much exactly. On a dot. And again, thank you so much for the opportunity to comment on, on your work. Okay. Now, are you keeping time? Or should I don't? I'll just, uh, here it says I should talk for five to 10 minutes. Okay. 
Um, well, to begin with, thank you, thank you all so much for your really generous comments, careful reading, and all of the really nice things that you said about the book. Um, I, I truly um, appreciate it. Um, I'll just kind of go through and respond as I made some notes. Um, um, yeah, your comments about, um, well, first of all, how provocative it is, I suppose, or like um, tendentious maybe is, you know, so in some ways, like I felt like I had, you know, discovered, you know, and, and in some of the spirit, I think that Dennis was speaking this, this sort of overly reductive narrative about what formalism is and how um, all of these kind of misconceptions I felt, um, which maybe as I said in my intro, I was more exposed to in the experience of doing these postdocs with you know, people primarily in English studies and across the humanities. And they said, well, now tell us about Russian formalism. And I was really became aware that there was a need to kind of correct the story about Russian formalism. So I went into that with like with much uh, <laughs> gusto and um, I don't want to say that, you know, carried away. I don't, wouldn't like to, you know, to come across this demonized that I felt that I was sort of telling this other story um, about uh, the formalism that, you know, in the, you know, you open the encyclopedia, it tells you, well, these were more or less these kind of um, shortcomings that were overcome, fortunately, by, you know, by late, by mid, you know, mature structuralism. So, um, um, but to your point about, kind of other like a compatibility of the what I'm sort of terming calling this kind of philologically mm -hmm. I mean the way I try to position it is that you as I said that you have um like a method and a philosophy and um and that it allows you to see what Tinyanov is doing as one reaction right that you know form is understood as this kind of dynamic structure which mm -hmm. has a sort of model at least Svetlakova argues in a kind of um philosophy of psychology and that form is kind of understood within a sort of dynamic system. Um, and then you have other kind of approaches between psychology and forms such as Shkovsky's, which sees that, you know, oh, you have these kind of tendencies to, you know, you have a sort of forward drive and then you have this impulse to decelerate or you have this, you know, overarching theory of uh, similarity associations, which explains parallelism and poetic language. And so these are posited as like, you know, universals, which for Shklovsky, very importantly, kind of operate outside of the study of language or linguistics, right? Which is one way in which this mode of formalism, right, by not kind of having to go through um, the kind of la langue or like the, the system of language allows you to think about form in terms which may be kind of compatible with something like computational approaches or with cognitive poetics as I as I point out. Um, in terms of like further kind of elaborating other approaches which have not been, I think, fully appreciated, which I didn't give maybe, you know, as much space to um, were I to continue writing this or write another <laughs> chapter on this subject, I think I would probably dedicate even more time to say the prog linguistic circle and, this, mm -hmm. and the alternative semiotics of, of the interwar period. And that I think that you get, obviously, you know, work with like say Ustanovka or Einstellung orientation, mm -hmm. but not understood in the way that say even Jakobsen uses it after 45 once he's using this communication yeah, theory yeah, model, but right. when it's really embedded in a, a different psychology, Karl Buchler and, um, you know, um, Husserl. And so you have, you know, many more chapters potentially to be written about alternative um, and very sophisticated um, kind of notions of, of poetic language form structure, um, all of which will seem, I think, largely unfamiliar to, um, you know, many people. Yeah, right. today. Um, Mark, to your, to your questions, um, you had so many good questions. Um, uh, I think what you see, though, the question about whether, like, what, what, what's the, what's the relationship between someone who's just like retelling a fairy tale, or not retelling, but telling their own preserved performance of a fairy tale, and then sort of the avant-garde performance of 
Kruchonek on stage, you know. I mean, Jakobsen is on the record saying that, you know, all folklore is Zalmi, right? Mm -hmm. That that actually folklore is already avant-garde. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, well, how does he mean this? And, you know, I really take him to be saying that it really is just a matter of degree, right? That although it may seem that you know, the folklore performer is, well, for, and for one thing, this, the commonality is that, you know, according to the formalist that the uh, folklore like Zaum is very much oriented towards the kind of palpability of language and language play. So that's one connection. But I think that it's not really seen as a stock of just, you know, in both cases, some sort of stock of phonemes that you're rearranging or some sort of stock of devices that you're rearranging. The, the utility of the performer as a concept of thinking about the author is that it happens in a, in a context. And what makes the performance always original is that it's to this specific group of people on this specific time and place. And this was um, for Shklovsky, you know, and for say Brick with this notion of social demand or social zakaz, that this is what kind of makes um, the study of form or the idea of art kind of it has this important social um, dimension which right as we've said kind of gets erased from the understanding of what formalism is interested in right so that the performer is not just reordering the stock of things but she or he is doing it for the specific um, occasion, right? So I guess that's that's part of what comes out of the sort of Humboldtian legacy. Um, and biography, I like this idea of biography as a sort of interest, like a, a filter or a frame for, for poetic traditions. Um, um, and I, I, I like it, <laughs> I'll say, I, I like it, I'll use it. I think for Shklovsky, it's particularly interesting. And, and the notion that philology during wartime yeah, I'm not sure my answer is so satisfying, but um, I, you know, I think that they really were thinking in utopian terms to a degree, right, at this moment of revolution that maybe uh, escape us to some degree um, that, you know, like, I feel like Eisenstein is sort of the best um, at articulating this notion, right, of montage as having just mind-blowing potential, right? <laughs> so that you you put things together in a different way, and it's going to completely change the way people think. Um, so I, it's maybe a little bit lost, but it's also nice to think that we find some solidarity with the formalist, I suppose. Um, and and Dennis, um, am I going way over time? No. Um, um, thank you so much. I'm really glad to hear that this um, that this spoke to you, and I'm, I'm eager to read your book on American formalism, how to write a bestseller. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I completely. It's interesting you brought up Yarho. Um, I think you know work is being done on Yarho um, by by Pilshikov, who I mentioned, and who is um, uh, really leading the charge on trying to get more of these minutes of the meetings of the Moscow Linguistic Circle transcribed and published. They're, I think, very interesting, and they are full of all kinds of arguments that you would really never imagine coming out of the mouths of, say, Jakobson or something, right? Um, you know, again, it's the context of the conversation, so you have to account for that. But, um, and they, you know, they delve into all kinds of interesting um, territory, and, and it really bring the project of formal theory really immediately into the situation of the civil war and that dialectology was really the way of studying the, the linguistic kind of battlefield as it were um, at the time that they're speaking. Um, and, I, and, I, and I appreciate your thoughts about how this notion of form that I'm kind of recovering or trying to bring respectability back to you in, in the context of the formalists is um, relevant for say computational approaches because you know it is this notion of form as something stable and countable which you know dynamic form is not really so um, in that sense I could see um, I would be really interested to learn more about how 
maybe bringing my knowledge, you know, maybe more kind of closely into the projects that um, that are, you know, ongoing today. And that, you know, say the poetic dialectology project, I can imagine, you know, could, you know, be something. Maybe it's already what people are doing in computational linguistics to some degree. Um, but there is, you know, I think kind of more to be brought out of the history. But thank you very much. And now, any questions, comments, responses from you all? I have a couple questions, and I hope they're intelligible because I'm kind of like at the edge of areas of my expertise here and really looking forward to learning from your book. Um, um, and maybe this is just opportunities for you to give some exposition of parts of your book. Uh -huh. um, but what is, because here's my first question, I have like, I think three closely related ones. What is the origin of the idea that structuralism is the culmination of formalism? How did that happen? How did that become a commonplace? At some point, I don't know, 10 years ago or something, I recognized that that was just like a total non sequitur. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense even. Um, and I, I don't know how that became a commonplace. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, you know, so just to be more specific about that, right? So like structuralisms in the 1960s, right, are calcs from linguistic structuralism's analysis of grammatical and a particularly phonological uh, level of analysis onto non-linguistic sign systems, right? right? So like in, in Jacobsonian terms, it's like an analysis of code that's then moved into other sign systems, whereas formalism is an analysis of message, right? It's an analysis of the poetic function, not the metalingual function. So like if there's just some sort of like weird category mistake in structuralism uh, being seen as an outgrowth of formalism. I just don't know how that how that happened. Um, uh, and then, so if non-linguistic structuralisms are analogies from linguistic structuralism and linguistic structuralism ultimately, you know, via Saussure derives from neo-grammarian practice. Um, so like his dissertation on or his monograph on like uh, laryngeal theory and Proto-Indo-European. Mm -hmm. And this and formalism, I guess your book argues also derives from neo-grammarian practice. Are they like two, is the is the argument that they are two divergent streams that come out of the same well, kind mm -hmm. of? And then I guess another question, and this relates to uh Ilya's commentary as well. Uh just you know, uh inform me because I'm ignorant. Uh, what is the explanation for formal change over time in the people that you're studying? Is it some sort of like analogy to like loud gazettes, like to, to these like exceptionless sound laws? Mm. And like, is it cognitively based? Like, what is the what is the source of formal of regularities of formal change over time? Right. Good question. Yeah. Okay. Did I just yeah. answer? Yeah. Great. Thank you, Adam. Um, the idea that structuralism is the combination, uh, the structuralism, the culmination of formalism, I would say, comes from Jakobson himself. Um, already in in his, I mean, what structuralism are you talking about, right? So it gets already formalism. So Jakobson moves to Czechoslovakia in 1920. By 1926, he's setting up the Prague linguistic circle. It like becomes a sort of internationally known organization, which is calling itself structuralist by 1929. Um, and Jakobson, of course, was you know, one of the founding formalists. So he, in his own evolution of his thinking, he sort of moves from a sort of formalist stage into a structuralist one. Um, and he's accompanied by Bogatidov, uh, who is also a formalist, becomes a structuralist. Yuri Tinyanov, you know, visits Prague. They're translating the formalist works into Czech. Um, and so you can, and much has been written on this subject of <laughs> how you demarcate, you know, some sort of transition from formalism to structuralism. But even beyond that, we need to point out that, you know, post-45 Jakobson structuralism is very different from sort of interwar structuralism um, because of this notion, say, of code, and of the idea that you know information theory is the model for thinking about phonology, which is all kind of post-war. Um, so you have like 
an evolution in various stages. Um, and Jakobson himself is very kind of uh, enthusiastically uh, teleological in his thinking on many levels, you know, including biographically, where his later kind of overcoming or separation from what was now becomes known as like early formalism and is sort of rectification of errors and um, and Shklovsky's, uh, Shklovsky's early ideas come, or Shklovsky's thinking in general comes to stand for the kind of fall, the false start of Russian formalism, which um, is only kind of encouraged by the sort of attacks on formalism within the Soviet Union. So is he like recognizing accidents of his own biography as being kind of theoretical progression? I, I mean, he does like, you know, I get some pleasure in demonstrating Jakobson's uh, about faces, right? Where he'll kind of have one articulate, he had, makes these kind of overtly neo-grammarian statements in like the late 1910s. And then by like 19, you know, say, you can find him saying the exact same thing with the opposite later, right? <laughs> so he changes, but he's presenting it as a kind of forward evolution when in fact he's keeping some things, he's changing his, is changing his um, kind of underlying model that he's operating with. And he still calls himself a philologist on his gravestone, right? So it's not like he himself is not a sort of, he keeps in some ways these different historical moments around later on, but he's um, presenting the theory that, um, that a way that he becomes best known for as the sort of peak of his uh, accomplishments. Um, and as sort of Sassur coming out of philology and formalism coming out of a philology or neo-grammarian linguistics, um, I don't know if they're two, they're both, you know, it, they're coterminous. They're happening at the, you know, they're writing at the same time. Um, my, my take on that relationship is that, you know, you have, formalism emerging before any of them were really reading or aware of Sassur, um, which is clear. Um, and so they already have kind of ideas, a program, a method, some kind of sense of what you're supposed to be doing if you're doing literary studies. Then Sassur is discovered and with some time he's incorporated with modifications into, into what their, their understanding of language. But it's, it's, yeah, like just two footnotes kind of to, to follow, you know, not the longer drinking conversation, I think, but, but the two footnotes is the, the conflation of, of uh, formalism with new criticism, and then the history of post-structuralism and kind of the canonization of certain theoretical texts, which told the story of formalism and structuralism in a way that became very common to teach in, you know, graduate schools from, you know, the 80s onward. So there is a particular version of, of secondary sources that, you know, I, I think we're just taught and accepted widely as like the accepted historiography through this lens of post-structuralism, which were which is a very biased lens in the sense that they were also, well, just like formalists, they were interested in, you know, patricide and kind of like uh, distancing themselves from certain, you know, in, in a very specific historically contingent way. So that's, I'll, I'll leave it with that. Thank you. Other questions? Please. Um, I have a question about the this, that misconception of, of uh, formalism, uh, which several of you mentioned. And um, well, do you have any idea why it happened and when did it happen? Was it already present in 1930s when formalists were active, the most active? Or maybe there was some turning point when it became like more, uh, the notion that became more apparent that uh, formalists are that kind of very focused and uh, restrict in their methodology. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, a, yeah, I, we haven't touched so much on what was happening in the Soviet Union. And so I think that a big part of it is the debates between formalism and Marxism, you know, beginning in the early 1920s, where um, even though, you know, the formalists are, are constantly arguing that they understand what they're doing to be um, 
kind of engaged with um, social reality and um, in some ways to be a kind of just a better version of a Marxist compatible analysis, right? A lot of the formalist notions of say literary evolution seem, you know, like they're gesturing towards kind of dialectical evolution um, of literary um, literary language um, or that they have a, um, you know, increasingly kind of interested in the, um, the way in which so extra linguistic discourses or concerns are um, taken up into literary um, literary works, but the the conversation is is such that it's rather non-productive, and so you end up with a kind of a version of formalism as um, you know. Trotsky's sort of called you know Trotsky's you know analysis of formalism is actually quite perceptive, but at one point he sort of describes them as sort of statisticians, right? They're just kind of counting syllables, um, which is, you know, one aspect, particularly say Yarko's aspect mm -hmm. or interest, um, but is a very narrow take on what the formalists were doing. So there's a nature of the bait to sort of cast your opponent in the sort of narrowest, <laughs> least generous terms. And so I think that's part of it. But, um, Yes, there's probably a whole other book on the Marxist overloading of the term form, so both by the com you know by the Communist Party with, in the Soviet Union, but also in you know with, with critics like Eagles and, and uh, Jameson who who write you know a lot of the Marxism in form, but they kind of decontextualize the term form you know in a in a Marxist kind of way. Mm -hmm. and the whole probably the whole other thing to be said about that confusion of Marxism. Historical just, just Can you compare Soviet approach and American approach to the formalism? Let's say during the 20th century, just briefly, just main, main, main differences. If I, if I, if you understand the question, maybe it's. Is your um, uh, I mean, I, I the. The, the fact that formalism gets received in the US as a kind of ally to new criticism is in large part because formalism is already perceived as the foe of Marxism. So it's like my enemy is your enemy. And, and they're like, look at, um, Ehrlich, Victor Ehrlich. Oh, yeah. Ehrlich is, a, is an emigre who um, from the Soviet Union, I think to Germany, then to the US, he wrote a memoir where he describes all of this. And he is a sort of anti, you know, anti-Marxist by, you know, notion of, you know, his self and his, the, the sufferings of his family by the time he arrives in the US. And he kind of presents Russian formalism in this extremely influential monograph already published, I think in like 56, which is, you know, presenting formalism as, you know, the foe of, of Marxism. So they're really actually in some ways, you know, historically intertwined, but I think, yeah, that that's. And then those sort of, you know, sorry to sort of continue on this, but then the kind of generation of, of, theory, of, of scholars in the US, like say Mary Louise Pratt, who, um, you know, understand their work to be kind of neo-Marxist, you know, cast even, kind of even more tightly bind formalism and structuralism with new criticism as the, like, so it just becomes this accepted truth that that formalism and Marxism are kind of opposites. It's very sort of reductive. Yeah, 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 yeah. Mark, are there questions on Zoom? Yeah. Others? That's a silly question. Um, so uh, I, it was always hard for me to get into Putibnya, right? And so I've been kind of grateful for Shklovsky for kind of like dispatching him, discrediting him, so I don't have to go back and, and deal with him. But but I, I taught a, a literary theory 
course, um, in a philology program in Russia, and Boris Maslow kind of designed the syllabus. So, of course, there was Vasilovsky and Patibnya. And I was surprised that your students really wanted to talk about Patibnya, yeah. right? So, <laughs> should, have I gotten him wrong? Should I go back to Patibnya? And what, what could I get from him uh, that that's, would be um, worthwhile? Well, my, my thoughts on that are don't read Mussolini. <laughs> read, read his, yeah, that's what... read his lectures that you know I think are better written and later in his career that seem I think you know digestible, interesting, um, insightful commentary. I think you know if if you're interested in um, kind of understanding of the sign in a sort of pre you know or thinking about the you know poetic uh, work of art as a kind of semiotic uh, um, concept pre again as we're saying you might go back and read him for that um <laughs> it's been a while since i read a lot of Petunia. um he's a difficult going i, I would agree mm -hmm. um, um and some on some topics he's quite quite lucid. I think that you could read him for, you know, his, what he says about the fable, for instance, or these specific genres um, are. Yes. yes. So I think you hinted that you could write another chapter or maybe even pursue another book on the Prague angle. Yeah. So can you give us a preview of, of what might develop there? What uh, are the particular findings in the current book that are, are going to explode a little bit what we think about the Prague School? Um, yeah, no, good <laughs> question. I, I, would, I am feeling, you know, just, you know, that I'm ready to return to the Czech chapter. Somehow the way that this book evolves in order to rein it in and make a coherent argument, the Czech material kind of got squeezed out. Um, it just didn't fit as well. And it was already kind of going in a lot of different directions. <laughs> right, yeah, yeah Czech. Um, um, but yes, I, I found, you know, even when I was working on kind of the later rounds of revision of this, that I had, um, you know, not even a, appreciated the extent to which, say, Czech structuralism is interesting and that it's quite different, as I mentioned, from, say, you know, what we can, how we canonically sort of understand structuralism um, and that there's a kind of a different tradition of of thinking about semiology um, that's at stake. Um, I also, I think myself, I'm ready to kind of move out of the period um, and I'm working on a narratological project, which I'm interested, you know, in then going back to say the later Czech structuralist work um, of Vodička and Dolizel on, on narrative theory. So that's like a kind of different project, but I will kind of go back to the Czechs, but not to rewrite this book, certainly. You know? Thank you. Yeah. All right, we'll make a huge thanks to the panel. Yeah. <laughs>